Welcome back, everyone, to another episode as we bring our International Month to a close on DTLW Podcast. Today, we are speaking with Friska Wiria, representing the Rocks, New South Wales, Australia. I am so happy to have you with me. Friska is a digital transformation and change management thought leader. She is a TEDx speaker and the force behind Fresh by Friska and is here to shift resistance into resilience. Friska, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for the warm welcome. Well, we are excited about this conversation. And folks, we will be speaking about moving from resistance into resilience. But before we get into all of that great conversation, Friska, tell us a little bit about you. Um, well, your introduction was pretty good, actually. So I'm a multi-hyphenate. I started my consulting business at the worst time ever, two months before COVID in Australia, November 2019. And then a few months later, the pandemic hit, all our borders shut. And when all our borders shut, it took with it my entire pipeline. So talk about change, talk about a great business card. But I just focused on establishing myself as a thought leader you know, um, connecting with really good prospects and clients. And really that's got me from where I am today. So it was a rocky beginning, but I couldn't have asked for a better advertisement than the power of managing change effectively than COVID because we've seen entire countries implode um, through their hospitals, their their entire economic system, you know, their, their financials, et cetera. You've seen the impact of not managing change well. And then those instances, it really was life or death. So I do the exact same thing, but for very large organizations. Now, first, you, you mentioned uh, the pandemic. You mentioned a time of mm. dire change for the entire mm. world. We all felt the effects and the impacts. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so during that time, you saw some sort of inspiration, right? And And inspiration usually... Yeah is the catalyst so at least can get you to the door of change for you to go through it. So why is inspiration so important when, when you talk about change? Yeah, because people won't do something just because you tell them to. They need to want to do it. And when they want to do it, it's usually because they're called to serve to a greater good or a higher purpose. And when I say high purpose in, in the pandemic sense, it was other people in the community. So Jacinta Ardern, the New Zealand of Prime Minister, she was a masterclass in inspirational leadership. But in organizations, you know, CEOs, senior leadership figures had to do the same thing. They had to inspire their workforce to continue to be productive, to look after their loved ones while they were working from home. You know, changes were coming left, right and center. So this is important. To be inspirational is important when it comes to change because, first of all, it helps motivate action. Change can be challenging it is always met with resistance whether it's subtly or overtly and inspiration serves as the powerful catalyst that motivates people to do something different motivate them to take a chance because usually they're scared of something and commit to the journey ahead it also helps foster alignment so inspiration can provide a sense of shared purpose among people and so it aligns individuals around a common vision and it ensures that everyone's moving in sync pursuing the same goals and working collaboratively and last but not least it helps cultivate a positive culture i mean who doesn't want to work for an inspirational leader and in australia the cost of a toxic culture it leads to a lot of workplace stress and it costs about 14 billion dollars annually just in our little country so imagine what the cost is in the u.s so the reasons that inspiration is a fundamental building block to inspiring people to change. Now, in the inspiration comment you did there, you mentioned the prime minister, you mentioned CEOs, you mentioned leaders, and leaders mm. undoubtedly have a very pivotal and very critical part when it comes to change. So what role do we have as leaders in change? Yeah. So Newsflash, often leaders think their only role is signing the check, is giving away budget or doing the rah-rah at a town hall, but it's so much more than that. So there are five main roles a leader has during change. The first is communicator. Now, you cannot stay silent on these issues. You have to regularly and visibly voice your support for the change, why you support the change, the benefit it will bring, and how you'll personally help 
people adopt to the status quo. Number two is liaison. So as a change management consultant, I'm expecting leaders to be the go-between between between myself and their team. So I can't be everywhere at once. And really they're a two-way conduit to elicit important information on how people are thinking, feeling, where they are on the resistance curve and what could potentially remove obstacles. Um, Number three is advocate. They have to be a big advocate for change. The most accepted and successful changes, whether it's a new LBTQI plus policy, whether it's a new restructure, whether it's a new cybersecurity compliance procedure, they're successful because the leaders advocate for the change. Like they're not invisible. They're out there, you know, shouting from the rooftops. Um, Four, which is very important, is resistance manager. So often leaders make the mistake of delegating, removing resistance to people like myself, to the change management consultant. But really, it's not my role. It's the leader's role because I haven't got the years of experience in the organization. I haven't got the credibility. I haven't got the gravitas. I consult and advise leaders on on how to create the the conditions that resistance won't be so powerful. But it's up to the leaders to do something about it. They're the ones that need to have the direct conversations with people that are refusing to get on the bus. And last but not least, they need to be a coach. So they need to be to coach people through the change process and help them move, like you said, from resistance to resilience. And this doesn't happen overnight. So they have to be there to as a support, as a guide to help their teams move through the commitment curve. And you mentioned the power of resistance, right? The resistance curve and the role mm. leaders have in that. And it always baffles me how resistance reach truly are when it comes to change. So why do we resist change and how can we get in the right mindset for change? Mm. Well, prehistorically resistance protected us. So in, in the prehistoric era, anything that was foreign, hadn't seen before, we ran away from it because it was dangerous and it saved a lot of lives back in the day. Right. But We don't have dinosaurs anymore, but we haven't evolved as much as we wanted to. And so my tips for that is prepare your mind for new opportunities and involving challenges. Think of all the things that you enjoy now or that you do effortlessly. Driving a car, riding a bike, Excel, um, figuring out Zoom, like all these things, they were really challenging when you first started. But now think of all the benefits you've been able to enjoy because you've been able to do all these things. So really the key is to adopt a growth mindset. So believe that your abilities and intelligence can be developed through effort and learning. Change at the end of the day, it's an opportunity and it opens up so many possibilities. And instead of, you know, viewing obstacles, 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 just view them as stepping stones to progress to where you want to be. I think you need to also cultivate a sense of, self-compassion like when I was learning to ride a bike for example I didn't learn instantly overnight you know I had my training wheels on I practiced every day after school and within months hey presto I could ride on two wheels it's the same with organizational change like you can't know everything and learn everything after two three days so it, it does take time to build the capabilities to build those change muscles so remember that when you're being too hard on yourself Um, Another tip I'd have is to focus on the positives. So shift your focus to what you might be losing to what you stand to gain. Um, So identify the potential benefits and opportunities for yourself uh, that can emerge from um, embracing this particular change. And lastly, set realistic goals. Rome wasn't built in a day and you can't transform an organization in a day either. So celebrate the small wins along the way because they'll generate momentum for even more change. Um, And another one of my frameworks that I like to share why people resist change is because they fear loss. And they fear loss because of one of these six areas. I call them the six Ps. So prestige, power, position, protection, pay, and performance. First is prestige. They may be attaching their self-image to something and the change may mean that it's under threat. So for example, um, a new financial structure may mean that 
this particular person who had a team of 10 and could sign off on purchases of $50 million, it could mean it's half that. So their sense of self-esteem may be knocked about a bit by this particular change. They won't tell you that, but you can observe and you can kind of connect two and two together. Number two is power. So they may be a very senior person and this change may mean they're demoted or their job title changes. So they seem to lose their sense of power. Third is position where it's pretty self-explanatory. People may think this change is threatening their job. Uh, number four is protection. So in many organizations, especially large ones, there are what we call protected species. They seem to be the favorite of someone in the leadership team and they're protected. They're protected um, even though they, they may not be um, may not have the right cultural fit or their performance may not be that great. So this layer of protection may be removed, especially in, in an it, when the change results from a restructure. So again, they may resist because of that. Um, the fifth P is pay. So they may be concerned that this particular change may mean their bonuses are under threat or they're not going to meet their KPIs. Last but not least, performance. So they may have been really good at this particular piece of software for the past 20 years. Now that software is going to be replaced by something else. So this means their A-star team status is under threat because they're going to be on the same level as everybody else and they'll have to learn just like everybody else. So when people are resisting, it's usually one of these six Ps that's going around inside their head that they're scared of losing. We look at those P's in different ways, but I love how you put it there. Earlier, you spoke about the roles of leaders and undoubtedly the role of a leader is to get their people to the promised land, whatever that may be. And in this yeah. conversation, it's resilience. So what mm. can I do as a leader to get my people from resistance to resilience? Mm. The first um activity that I'm going to say is the one that leaders struggle with the most and that is direct communication so direct communication that's open honest and transparent is essential so articulate the reason for the change the expected outcomes how it aligns with the team's purpose and values address concerns and questions openly and foster a sense of trust and transparency people struggle with this because we're not actually taught in schools how to have constructive conversations, how to deal with objections, how to deal with unexpected emotional flare-ups, like what if someone bursts into tears? A lot of leaders that I've met, pretty much 99% of them are very uncomfortable with this, very uncomfortable. But really, leaders want to hear from you. Like if you're for it, tell them why. If they're concerned about it, tell them what you'll do to address those concerns. And a second tip relating to that is after you communicate directly and transparently, don't just disappear. Like often people, the next day is when things flare up, much like an injury. So, you know, like many times I've been in town halls where leaders say, yep, we're, we're moving in this direction. We're restructuring this area here. Any questions? No one puts their hand up. And they're like, oh, that was amazing. Everybody was on board. It's like, no, it wasn't amazing. <laughs> it's because they're going through the six Ps in their head. They've gone home. They've thought about it overnight. And they've come back with a laundry list of questions. That's usually what happens. So a second tip relating to this is to be available and be patient. So people react to change in different ways at different cadences. So just hold the space. Hold the space for people that may take a while to digest what it means for them. Have an open door policy and be there when they need you. Be available when they need you. Um, a third tip I had was to listen actively. So be attentive to your team members' perspectives and challenges and really listen, you know, not just in one ear, out the other, and check back in with them. Like communication, successful communication is a two-way street. It's not just them going blah. It's you taking that information in, digesting it, thinking about it, and coming back with a thoughtful response. That'll mean a lot. Like there's nothing worse than asking people if they have any questions, taking them, saying you'll get back to them, and then not coming back to them. Like that makes them feel 
this this small and it doesn't do any good to inspiration, motivation or engagement. Um, the third is to involve the team. So get them into the tent early, encourage them to participate, get them involved in the process, empower them to contribute ideas, offer solutions, maybe take ownership of some aspects of the change. Because when people feel like they're involved in something, they are much more likely to support and accept the change. And last but not least, you got to walk the talk, man. Like you got to lead by example. you got to be a champion of the change that you wish to see. Um, so there was a lot of um, bad press drama here in Australia when some members of our um, government, very senior government officials, was said, you know, don't do this, social distancing, always wear a mask, blah, blah, blah. And they were seen doing the direct opposite. Um, they were captured in the media doing the opposite. The same with um, the UK, right? The prime minister, he had parties, for God's sake, when people were dying. <laughs> had parties in parliament so don't do that so lead by example showcase your adaptability and willingness to learn and that'll inspire people to follow absolutely great advice uh, when you talk about leaders it's not just the fact that you're bringing the change now mm. you have to manage what happens after you speak and i love how you mentioned be available you know, you just drop the bomb on somebody. Something's going to happen, and you now yeah. you're going to have to speak about that. So what yeah. should leaders be considering as they're managing the change process with their teams? Mm. Um, the first is really underscore the link between vision and clarity. So why are we doing this in the first place? Like, well, you're not just changing for change's sake. So really make sure people understand not just the benefit to the business, but how it benefits the team, how it benefits themselves as individuals. Like there's nothing worse when you're at the airport and your flight's delayed and it keeps on getting delayed and you have no freaking idea why, right? I think it, airlines have slowly but surely learned, but before it used to be like two hours late, three hours late, tell me why. Like if you simply just said, there's an engineering fault. We're doing this for extra precautions, your own safety. People would be a lot less resistant. They'd be like, okay, good. It's it's for my own interests. The same goes for a change in large organizations. If people know it's for the best interests of the organization, they're more likely to accept it. Even when sometimes it means they're out of a job or you know one of their P's are threatened, they, they can understand it more. Um, the third is about, resilience and flexibility. So anticipate and address challenges that may arise during the change process. Um, encourage people to voice their concerns um, and reinforce the positive impact of their contributions. And, you know, inspiration and motivation, they kind of feed each other. And if it's a long-term change, like multiple years, it's really hard to keep that energy going. So you need to celebrate the successes, no matter how small they are, right? Um, so acknowledge and celebrate the successes along the change journey. Recognize the efforts of individuals and teams because often it is so hard to keep going when it seems like the change is years and years, light years away. So reinforce the impact of their contributions during the change process. And also stakeholder involvement and engagement. Really take the time early on to map out who's going to be impacted, who's going to be interested by the change, because there's more groups at stake than you think. It's not just, you know, team A that needs to use the system. Often you'll see trickle effects to other areas of the organization, both internally and externally true. It could be members of the public. It could be um, areas of the government. So really take the time up front to map this out early on to make sure that you get support for your people when you need it not when it's too late and you're playing catch up with resistance. In real estate, they say location, location, location. In leadership, we say communication, communication, communication. Totally, you, totally. You I, I, I'd say the top two reasons why change falls flat or it succeeds, it's the quality of the communication. So ongoing, frequent, interpersonal um, modern as well, because our attention spans compared to 20 years ago, today they're about seven seconds. 20 years ago, they were 20 seconds. 
so you can't keep relying on the boring old slide packs, the laundry list of lists, you know, heavy text. It needs to be interpersonal and engaging. So really invest in that. And number two is the quality of its leaders. So if leaders are charismatic, inspirational, if they're authentic, if they're open, you're going to, you're going to get to that change much faster. So those two are the most important variables. And one of the greatest challenges for leaders is relevance. So if you're mm. listening, everything that Friska has just discussed concerning <laughs> change management, again, your people to, you know, going from resistance to resilience is spot on. Now, Friska, I wanted to ask you, what do you have coming up? What's, what's in the burner for you? And how can people get a hold of you if they want you to come and facilitate some yeah. change management in their company. Enrique, this is such great timing because in five weeks, my book will be out. Uh, it's called The Future Fit Organization, A Leader's Guide to Transformation. So everything I've said and more, I share frameworks, case studies, um, guidelines, blueprints, everything I've shared and more is going to be in that book. So it, it was based on my highly rated TED talk, which is about the secrets of future fitness. So how can leaders structure their organization in a way so that their company actually does transform, that it's a real transformation, not a glacial evolution, which is what most companies are experiencing. Um, if people want to get a hold of me, they can simply search me on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Friska. Um, my website is freshbyfriska.com uh, and my Insta handle is of the same name. Outstanding. Now, folks, I'm going to make sure to have all that information as part of the video, the show notes, so you can get a hold of Friska's book, her offerings on a website, and be able to communicate with her on LinkedIn. Friska, thank you so much for sharing not only the knowledge that we discussed here, but what you're working on. And congratulations on that book, by the way. I can't <laughs> wait to get my hands on it. Ah, thank you. I'm very excited. <laughs> well, folks, today's episode is sponsored by Fantail Services and Superpass, which are powering our website and app, Southern Sweet and Sassy Coffee, and Hot Chester London. And if you've enjoyed this episode and learned something interesting about the topic covered today, make sure to subscribe and let us know by leaving a comment right now. And we're always looking for new ideas and guests that we can have to our show. So if you know someone or have a topic that you would like featured on the podcast or want to sponsor our show, we'd love to hear about it by emailing us at triadleadershipsolutions at gmail.com. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode where we dissect leadership from another angle. And as we like to end the show, success to you. <laughs>